Yeah, good morning, everybody. Jamie Wallace here for our next uh, Q&A, where we're looking at uh, lesson five today. So thank you very much for joining me this morning. And um, yeah, we're getting into deeper, deeper parts of site analysis. And uh, that's what this lesson's all about, is really taking a close look at um, our sort of macro watersheds and micro watersheds and how those can affect our project sites and how we can design around that. So let us take a peek. Uh, let's let us take a peek at the assignment and we'll see if anybody has any questions right out of the gate, but I'm just going to go through and do a couple of examples for you. Um, yeah. And then, We'll just see where everybody wants to take the meeting and we'll go from there. Okay, so we are in lesson five and it's all about water. And today we are looking at uh, three different parts of this lesson and or assignment. And basically, we have uh, the beginning of the assignment, which is a water survey, and that is extremely straightforward. Um, really, we're just wanting to know uh, where your water's coming from, where your wastewater is going, and where um, what kind of roofing material you have. Those are some key points that we want to take into the next part of the assignment where we're looking at watershed mapping and we are going to be looking at uh, sort of macro and micro. The macro is quite simple. Uh, the, the micro can be a little bit tricky for some people to get, um, get used to, but it is pretty straightforward. And then we're looking at site water flow analysis. So how water moves across your site. And as you can see, <clears throat> the points awarded to each one are somewhat related to the amount of work, time, and effort that uh, you undoubtedly will be putting into those. So again, if we take a quick look at the water survey, that's very straightforward. You may, may have a sewage system. You may have a septic system. We want to know about that. And of course, this record 24-hour rainfall event that... Uh, I'm sure most of you found information on that. Um, that's going to be very handy because we're we're going to calculate our micro watershed. So what uh, lands that are uh, around our project site, which can influence them in the event of uh, runoff from those outlying areas. And then that sort of sets a little bit of the tone in terms of uh, how we might best protect our pro uh, project site in the event of a high rain event. And that's where this 24 hour number comes in. So it can be quite surprising. And even if you're looking just from um, a rooftop uh, perspective, how much is gonna hit your roof in a day and how your system should be uh, sized to handle that. Because we know that that number, I know, for instance, where where I live, um, my record rainfall event is about 90 mils. So, you know, it's getting close to, it's, it's, it's probably three and three quarter inches in a 24 hour period. Uh, saying that I've, since we've been here for the last 27 years, I've witnessed uh, a rainfall event that was, uh, I think around 30 mils in 15 minutes. <laughs> so, it uh, a lot of it has to <laughs> depends on what duration of time it's going to fall in. So you definitely want to be as prepared as possible for that. Uh, yeah, so that's about it for the survey. And then again, the mapping, the macro is very simple. Uh, you really just have to, um, for instance, if we go in here and where I live, uh, I can just look for watershed map in the RDN. That's the district I live in, the area. 
And, you know, I get all sorts of uh, resources here, and I'm sure you are going to find the same. So, again, this is, uh, this is that macro watershed, and there's lots of really interesting maps online uh, that you'll be able to find, certainly if your project site's within North America. And I don't think we usually have a few students that are outside of, um, of this area. I believe we have one in Colombia, so that um, that might be a little trickier to find these sorts of maps, but it shouldn't be too bad. <laughs> so that that is uh, very easy. Um, the next is a, it's a little bit trickier, just nothing that you can't um, do a little practice with and, and get the, the feel for it. And we're going to go through that. And there's several different <clears throat> resources that you can find here in the assignment resources tab. So we're basically looking at, and this should perhaps be a little more specific because we in the assignments, we're asking for macro and micro, and here we're just talking about watershed. So these resources uh, right here are definitely worth watching. And there's a number that are very, very useful, uh, in particular, the micro versus macro. So I would encourage you to look at those. And we have a watershed practice sheet so that is a really good thing to go through. And most people um, nail that pretty easily. So, which is great. We're just gonna go to the template file here. <clears throat> and uh, so this isn't too hard. We're, uh, I don't think we'll be working with this today, but um, the, the crux or, or the, the takeaway here is is really specified on the right here that that water is going to flow at a right angle to a contour so if we have i'll just get my pen going here oh let's see there's some stuff in the chat so derek has a question yeah we want you to include the practice sheet and if we go back uh, and take a look at the rubric, we'll see that that's asked for here. Um, there it is. So yeah, we want you to do the micro, micro watershed practice sheet uh, and submit that. And again, that's pretty straightforward, but we're gonna go through uh, a couple of the things here. Let's go back to our map. Yeah, so got distracted there. Sorry about that. Yeah, so water flowing at right angles to contour. So what does that mean? And sometimes it can take a little bit of effort to figure that out. Um, what does that mean? Well, we have a higher con. You know, this is a high point in the landscape, and then it starts to to head downhill and same with this here. So if we're trying to figure out how water is moving off of the surface, uh, right angle to contour is just that. So this would be approximately uh, right angle to contour over here. It's gonna go in that direction, uh, out, out, out on this ridge here. It's gonna go that way. Uh, whenever we see contours sort of bulging out of the landform, that's typically a ridge. And when we see the opposite, where contours are going into the hill, uh, that's basically going to be a, uh, a drainage point. So water is always going to run at a right angle to whatever contour. Now, this is not a great contour map. It's got some, uh, it's not quite as smooth as I would normally recommend using, but that is the basic of um, how water moves. Now let's take that into a, sort of a real life situation here. So this is um, the town I live in. It's not my exact location. 
but let's pretend that this is our project site. So let me just, uh, first thing I'm going to do is just draw a property boundary. So let's, let's say this, oh boy, <laughs> not the most beautiful boundary. Um, let's say that is our property boundary and we want to figure out what is above hill, uh, what is uphill from this. So we need some data. And if you don't have contour information on your project site, this is, uh, albeit a fairly inaccurate way of doing that, but it is, um, a way of doing it nonetheless. So contour map creator, you can, can Google that and, and find the location of your project site. And it's pretty easy. We want to put our, uh oh, I'm going to lose my line, I think. No, good. Uh, we're going to want to set our options here. So first thing we do is we'll put it at feet. Uh, I'm going to do a one foot contour. That's what I'm going to start with. So each interval will be one foot. And then once you have if, if you go up here and just tell it to put in seven different contours, they'll all be slightly different. So I don't recommend you doing that. We want to, we want to be able to see it consistently. So I would definitely um, uh, use this level interval and just set whatever number you think is going to look right. And you can always change it as I'll show you. But once we have this set up, what we want to do is click in one corner and then click in another and that sort of gives us our uh, the, uh, an outline of where the data is going to be placed on the map here so now i have gone and moved the map well we'll try and get it back where we want it okay so once you have once you've defined the outer edge you'd say get data and there we go, we have our one foot contours. Now I would never use this for professional purposes, but for this class, it's really useful if you're having trouble finding uh, data for your site. So at least with this, you're gonna be able to uh, practice and, uh, and get a rough idea of where your micro watershed is. Again, I would uh, be going after um, more accurate data if this was uh, a client's place. But let's start here. So the, the simplest way to go about this, I will just get different color. Yeah, maybe I'll change that. So the simplest way is you look at your project site and you go to the lowest part of the boundary, which would be right here. And that's where our, our work's gonna start. And we have to kind of reverse engineer uh, a little bit because we know that water is gonna run downhill. So this is a low point over here, and this is higher over here. Uh, and we're starting at the bottom and working up. So, we, again, we have to kind of uh, reverse engineer this process a little bit. So by starting at the very bottom of our site, we're gonna start moving up the edge here because the way these contour lines are uh, flowing, it's telling us that any water that strikes this part of the ground is heading in that direction as it's not gonna have anything to do with our project site. So we, ha we don't have to worry about that. But once we come up to this edge here, we can see that we're starting to head uphill a bit. And again, we're kind of projecting backwards a little bit. And this is not gonna be deadly accurate, but, and I'm gonna stop right there and then I'm gonna uh, move around to the other side. So I'm going to go along the bottom 
So now we have these bottom two corners established and we know for sure if water strikes this part of the uh, area, it's gonna be heading towards the ocean and it will not influence the project site. But when we come up to this project boundary right here, we can see that we're starting to pick up a little bit And this is not going to be the most accurate by any means. You can see we're starting to move uphill a little bit. And we get to this point. And then boom, we're up at the road. So in most urban settings, we are going to be constrained by uh, roadways. And the reason for that is uh, if we have rainfall here, uh, the water is not going to be passing over top of this road and heading downhill. It's going to get picked up with some um, stormwater uh, sewer or some in all likelihood, or it might be a roadside ditch. And when we get into ditches, it gets a little bit tricky there. Uh, if, if your project site had a culvert going under the road and was emptying onto your property, then you could actually start working uh, uphill from this point. But for the most part, we are we're going to uh, be ending our work at the road in an urban setting. So get rid of those. So we're almost done with a very rough draw here. So now we just have to join this up and. like we might be heading in this direction. And again, we're up on a road and we're up in a parking area. So I'm just gonna uh, run a line between those two and you know, in a very rough sense, uh, that's what I would define uh, the micro watershed. So interior here, inside these lines, this is going to be the basin. So we want you to indicate that too. Right, so we're, we're basins inside. So what does that tell us? That says that um, if we have... Uh, rainfall that drops here, there is this potential for that water to influence our project site. It doesn't mean it's going to. Uh, we have different coefficient factors that we can apply. So in, in for instance, if, if we were here in this area here and we had forest, or vegetation above us, uh, our coefficient factor might be 0.1, might be 0.2. So for every 100 gallons that hit here, maybe one or two gallons is going to influence our site. Uh, the same here, this is vegetated, uh, albeit sort of burnt out turf. And with that, uh, we can easily, we can do some very rough calculations. So that is uh, one practice here. We can clear that. And I see we've got a couple of questions here. We can, uh, if somebody wants uh, me to run through their project site, if you just drop your link in the chat, we can open up your document and we can take a look at that. And uh, so I'm quite open to doing that, no problem. 
Uh, Jessica has a question here. Our property has multiple springs. Is it important to show those water flows? Uh, yes, it is. And that's where this whole process can get quite, quite interesting. Because if you have, let's say you have um, a creek running through your property, then in essence, your micro watershed will also include lands that drain onto that creek. Now, you could argue that that water is just, it's in motion and going through the property, but it's, um, it's good to factor in nonetheless, uh, and it does get a little bit in the gray zone that way. Uh, for yes, so water flows are just the precipitation flows. Yeah, no, I would show where those are. Uh, if you have now, you say springs. So uh, maybe you could just answer a question, Jessica. Are these just sort of seasonal springs that pop up on your property? You can unmute or uh, just type in the chat here, whatever you prefer. Uh, all year. Okay. And those, yeah, springs are tricky because where are they coming from, right? They're not, um, I know we have a similar situation. We have a spring that pops up during the winter and trying to, I, I would indicate where the spring is, but I don't know how you would actually include a spring in a calculation like this. If it is a if it is a stream or a creek or a river well then that's um that is a lot easier and i suppose it it would probably be a good idea jessica just indicate where your spring is do you have some way of does that um does that water um flow off into another area is it picked up do you have to manage that because of uh, those flows during the winter. So you say that uh, your domestic water comes from a spring. Well, lucky you. That would be awesome. Okay. So I hope that answers your question, Jessica. Goes into your pond. Right on. And you have a large overflow. Right. Excellent. Okay. Was uh, do you feel your question was answered, Jessica, or do we need to expand on that a bit? Okay. Uh, Jenny has a question. What if the project site is on top of a hill? Uh -huh. Good question. That means you're on top of your uh, micro watershed. So there is occasionally a uh, student whose project site is right at the high point of a hill or or whatever and yes your your micro watershed ends up being your property boundary so that's how you would depict it you would just draw um your boundary around your site and show the basin that's inside and uh yeah, that may that's uh, as we'll go, as you'll see as we go through the course. You know, there's some positives and negatives with that. Um, obviously, the negative is you have what you have, and you're not likely to pick up any additional water from neighboring properties, which can be a a huge asset. Okay, so hopefully that answered your question there, Jenny. And Becca has a question. When we do this for professional purposes, what do you use to project water flow on a site of it if it's not contour map creator? Yeah, that's a great question, Becca. Um, usually what we do, there's a couple of different approaches we have. Um, for instance, we're, we're just starting a project in the next week or two. 
And we're having a uh, LIDAR survey done, like a drone survey, but it's LIDAR. So we will end up getting um, contoured data as part of this. So we'll get high resolution images and we will have contour data uh, supplied to us at the beginning of the project. And uh, the other option that we have done before is we can, if we don't want to do a survey, if it's if it's cost prohibitive, and with some projects, you know that can be the case, especially if it's um, um well, we have had a couple in the urban areas where it just seems silly to do drone surveys. So we we just go to um, a LIDAR depository. And where I live, uh, oops. there's a portal that our government has uh, put together that might not be it no nope. government websites oops sorry it was <laughs> they changed things around and if i go on here i get a map of the province i live in and um, all of the available lidar imagery which is shown in these uh, dark squares here. And you might think, oh my God, that's hardly anything, but you know, that's pretty much where um, the habitation is in the province. It's, uh, it's focused on the Southern boundary or the Southern edge here and up Vancouver Island, but it's great. Uh, we use this all the time. You just find the address and you can get all sorts of uh, information off of this. So I've found this in various parts of Canada, uh, as well as the US. The, the only challenge here is you, you need to be able to convert this into usable information. And that usually, uh, in, that is, normally you'd have to have, you know, either a knowledge yourself with QGIS or a GIS uh, type software, or you can also get uh, a technician to do this. So before learning it ourselves, we had um, a technician that we would send a file to and, um, you know, it was just a few hundred dollars and we got great data from him. Uh, the only downside of this that we have found is you got to be careful of, uh, let's say we had a project here and um, you just have to look at the date. So this was data that was extracted or taken in 2018. So if there's been any disturbances on the on the site since then, you will not that will not get picked up in uh, in that satellite data. So that's the only thing we have to be aware of, because uh, especially if we're doing a new new home or a new homestead, uh, this might be a consideration. And in that case, we just can get a drone survey which is uh, representative of um, uh, now versus previous when the satellite went over. So there's a number of different uh, approaches for you. And that's all part of the mapping. And that is, that's probably something we really haven't, um, you know, I think it was emphasized at the beginning of the course quite well, the importance of a really good base map. And, and this is all part of it. If you, if you have an interest, let's say in uh, agricultural uh, large scale design and you look at the agrarian platform, which I'm sure I've mentioned before, and that's 10 different layers, uh, different design layers. And the geography is the big one for, for this. This is where there's a huge amount of information placed on various maps and topographic is one of them. We do slope analysis and, uh, you know, all that is possible through um, sort of uh, cloud point data that I was referring to, the LIDAR data. Makes it a lot easier and um, 
only reason I learned a little bit about QGIS is because I'm a planner member on, on this uh, platform. These are all the free um, online programs that are offered. And uh, QGIS for mapping this, uh, this is great because it's all um, uh, video. So if I want to know, you know, basically how do I import LiDAR data, I can go here, watch the video and we're good to go. So um, yeah, it's not an intuitive software. And I think uh, Derek's quite familiar with it and he could probably concur. Yeah, I know my, I have a nephew who went to college and took um, uh, GIS. It was part of his uh, geography degree, I think. Uh, and he was, he was trained on it. He worked in the field for a while. He left the field for a couple of years and went to go back. And uh, it had changed so much. He just could not, um, could not get it. <laughs> so he had to leave it. Leave it for now. Things change quickly. Uh, let's see here. Now, so we've done one example. Does anybody want me to take a look at their project site and uh, and see what we can do with that? Um, we can take another look at... Well, I'm waiting on anybody to reply for that. We can take a look at the next project. Uh, part of the assignment, which is the site water flow analysis. And that that's pretty straightforward. Even though there's a lot of work here, it is straightforward. And one, one thing we're not asking you in the assignment, but that I would encourage you to consider is normally when we're looking at uh, designing, we put together our base plan. And then the first design layer that we're going to do is going to be called the water layer. And we're not asking you to design anything within the water layer at this point. You're really just analyzing what's going on, but do keep in the back of your mind, um, potentially what you could do that way. Um, I think the course might shift a little bit over time and we'll encourage people to start thinking about how they would design with the water. Uh, at this early stage, because we, we basically do water and then we do access and soil. So we prioritize uh, water uh, and access. And then the landscape, the soft landscape is basically, you know, the icing on the cake. We're just filling in uh, the spaces, so to speak, that um, are left after we have looked at those other other layers, if we look at the agrarian platform uh, and they have 10 layers, we are going through water access uh, ecosystem or forestry where we're, we're placing major elements, uh, plant elements, and then buildings and fencing. Then we get to soil, right? So on even buildings, most people purchase a property and first thing they think about is where am I putting the house? Uh, the reality is you should be going through a lot of different steps um, first to see where, because you can't, you can't change, easily change. Um, sorry. Just wanted to show you this because this is uh, largely what the agrarian system is based on. And even though you know I've trained in it and I do some uh, agricultural farm design, you know we still apply this whole structure to homesteads, but we just condense it. So this is the scale of permanence that PA Yeomans put together years ago, and it's a very simple chart. And uh, the higher up we are, the more difficult it is to change and the more time it would take to change. So you can see up in the top corner is climate. And although humans uh, have managed to uh, have an influence on climate, it's not something that's uh, easily done without a tremendous amount of energy. So when we're looking at land design, the climate and the land shape 
are two things that are extremely difficult to make adjustments to. So we have to really accept them, right? And even the water, how water behaves on your site. To change that uh, would, would require, you know, could require an incredible amount of energy uh, to do so. So you want to adopt what is, um, you know, what is currently, try and word this properly. Um, you want to recognize and make the most of the assets that uh, fall into this category. And if you have to uh, do some stormwater management because you have some flood risks, et cetera, well, often uh, this whole analysis is going to point that out. And then hopefully you're able to manage that water in a way where it's also going to be a rehydration um, outcome uh, with that. So in other words, where I live, here's an example. We have, when we have uh, peak rainfall events or heavy rainfall uh, or rain and snow mixed, a lot of precipitation hitting all at once, we get a little bit of pressure on our driveway and our parking area. So it starts to creep close to our garage and our house. Um, but all of that water is now uh, managed in a way where it's, it's Get, it gets put into a catch basin and it's piped to a huge rain garden we constructed. So that liability is now uh, helping to hydrate um, an area that would normally not receive it. So, all right. I won't go on about that anymore. Um, so yeah, the, the, the site and now the water flow analysis here uh, it, it is pretty straightforward. We want to know where does water enter your property and where does it leave? And that might be obvious. Uh, and it, it might not be. Uh, the roof areas where the downspouts are, maybe potential gray water locations, uh, where your outdoor taps are. And other impermeable surfaces. So that could be driveways, that could be walkways, that could be patio areas. So yeah, even a gravel driveway uh, is a compacted surface and it'll have some runoff. And of course, the direction of the slope and that you know will be easy to determine with our contour information, whether you have any wetlands or water. Um, significant water features. And of course you definitely need the, this, this exercise and the, the mapping is just not possible without contour lines. So that's something uh, you have to get. And again, contour map creator is, you know, it's the, it's easy, easy for us to access, but it's something that, um, you know, you don't want to use. You don't want to rely on it for professional purposes. And you might have a well. So we'd want uh, a little bit of info on that. The depth, if you if you know that, and the flow rate. Yeah, and then there, of course, there's a chart to fill in. That should be pretty straightforward. So this is where your map would go. And then you start to add some color in here, some polygons showing these impervious surfaces, and then some totals here. So your total area of your project site and how much water is generated from that. Well, I shouldn't say generated, potentially collected on an average annual uh, year. And then the 24 hour event here. And of course that all gets transferred onto this chart. So there's a little bit of charts to go through. Um, and we do something very similar to this when we're looking at um, rainwater harvesting uh, active collection, where we're putting it into, where we're putting the rainwater into a cistern. And the, the one thing we add here is we would add usage. Um, so what our projected usage is. So Becca has a question here. 
When you say water entering or leaving, do you mean the sewer municipal piping? No. No, not worried about that. Um, I would focus on water that you can uh, observe flowing onto your site. Uh, so where I live, I'm on, say, five acres. We have water visibly flowing from a neighbor above us into a an existing ditch. So, uh, but we do not, uh, well, we don't have any storm system here. We just have a roadside ditch we send it to. Um, but we also tap into it for our rain garden. But uh, yeah, we're not too worried about the piping and the existing uh, infrastructure taking that away. So it may be uh, certainly where we lived prior when the, the rain, a uh, rain of it hit, it would, uh, some of it would hit our uh, house roof, go into the, the gutters and eaves troughs, and then boom, out to the municipal storm system. So it wasn't even, you know, it was a resource we could capture, but it wasn't something that would end up uh, on our land. Now, some people, uh, some students will have situations where they'll have a gutter system and downspouts, and then it does dump out onto the ground. So everybody's going to have a slightly different setup. And then this is the extra credit. So uh, a little heads up with that. Um, this is all about your micro watershed. So whatever you did in the previous part of the assignment here under micro watershed catchment, if you basically copy that and throw it in here, you get some, some bonus points. So that's, a, that's an easy one. And let me see if there are, I think there's a couple of examples here. And somebody was talking about being on top of the hill. And this is one of those examples right here. So this project site is high on a hill and all the water runs off and there's nothing uh beside it that is influencing them so that is certainly uh, i'd say that's a little more rare but it does happen and those are more macro watersheds i don't know why they're in this uh, as an example but yeah so i'm happy to <clears throat> uh to do another example here uh, what are does anybody have any questions that they want me to take a look at or answer today? Or maybe something that's not completely clear. So this is a good time, good time to clear that out. Uh, the other thing is I'm just gonna put a link in the chat here for, just gotta find out. Get it. Yeah, I'll just put my my calendar link in the chart. And if somebody, if you're going through the week and you feel That you're stuck. There you go. Uh, yeah, if you're going through this exercise and you just, it's just not working for you, it's you can't understand it and you feel stuck, then if you click on that link, you can um, book a, a short Zoom meeting with me and we'll go through it and we'll, we'll help to streamline this. So Okay, Renee, good to see you, and thank you very much. Yeah, and good luck with uh, the assignment. 
Yeah. Okay. So does everybody feel comfy with, with lesson five? <laughs> Excellent. All right on. So Rachel says, no, not until I dig into it more. Okay. Can we do anything today to help you out, Rachel? No, I don't think so. I think I just need to start working my way through it. Okay. I, I might have questions that come up at some point and um, yeah, I might just, I might reach out to you. We'll see. Sure. Or I might sure. be fine. <laughs> Yeah, well, each side is individual, and um, it can actually be quite, uh, quite eye opening to see just how much uh, property outside your own site. Um, oh, Jessica has thrown in her. Okay, we'll take a look at Jessica's. Uh, work here and we'll take a look at our project site. So maybe what we'll do. Just got to get your address. Um, don't know if I can easily grab your address. Jessica, do you mind throwing your address in the chat? And then that will make it a little bit easier for me. Oh, but you have contour lines. Yeah, except they're 20 foot. So, and we need to look at um, outside your property boundary anyhow. So where you are in Oregon, you may be able to get some really nice uh, LIDAR data. I don't doubt that. I think all of Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, uh, has been mapped. Okay, I have to reset this. So we just have to try and figure out where we are here. Yeah, the whole U.S. I'm, I'm not sure, Derek, is it the entire or pockets of the U.S.? Probably pockets, but that's a great uh, link. Thank you for that. Okay. This is the tricky part, trying to locate... Okay, I think you're here, Jessica. I'm not sure. Let's flip back and forth. Yeah, that looks like you. Um, now, it might be kind of tricky to do your property boundary, but uh, let's see what we can do. All right. Okay, you were there, so I am here. Okay, well, and I, I don't think my property boundaries are going to be um, perhaps perfect, but we'll get them fairly close. Right. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> we're we're kind of like the right corner, lower right, right corner. Okay, I'll just uh, just got the spinning wheel here on my computer. I'll have to give it. Oh, there we are. You're in the right corner. Lower. Yeah, the lower right. Lower right. So you're not. This isn't your property boundary in here, or your right where your cursor is. Go straight down. Yeah, if you just go straight down. Straight down. Okay. So we're going this way. 
keep going. And it's about to here. Right. Yep. And then okay. do right. go right from there. And does it go off screen or are we? No, oh, that's pretty good. Okay. And this is just uh, uh -oh. now you don't go all the way, do you? Is it back up here and then angles over or just to the road? It's pretty much to the road, and then there's like okay. a cliff there. So. Okay. So somebody's subdivided and retained a bit of yeah. And that's not going to have anything to do with what we're. Yeah. Oh darn. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Yeah, it does. Except I'm not zoomed out enough, so we will <laughs> have to uh... do it again. There we go. Yeah, I'll have to redo that. That will zoom out a little. Yeah, and it's hard to know how much we're going to have to zoom out. Well, let's do a little test here before we get too far. And so in this case, where we're looking at a lot of property, maybe we will we'll start with 10 foot. Ten foot contours just to see if it's going to be... All right, so you can see, uh, we probably have to go back a little bit. So if you ever expand your area out, you have to get data again. So this is, it's getting a little clearer. So we can see potentially how far you may have to uh, yeah so now we got to find where you are I think you're back here so we will just put property boundary where we think you are we're a bit more to the left. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, we're just going to, I know this isn't where you are, but we'll pretend it is somewhat. Let's say that is your... Your boundary. Okay. So again, we're going to be starting. Yeah, that's fairly good. Yeah, you can't, you won't be uh, up to a little work to refine this for sure. But again, we start at the bottom. So that's the, the road edge by the looks of it. And we would start in that corner and we can already see that this contour is angling towards us. So we'd go there. Uh, sorry, I have a, a pen here that's not ideal, but basically we're, we're going to end up here. <clears throat> if we look at the other side, uh, we'd have that boundary along the bottom, along the road. And then this first line kind of kicks us in, uh, but we get kicked out pretty quick here. And I would say that we are heading to this little high point.
So we haven't, we need more space here, of course, but we can, it's pretty easy to see the influence of the creek and how that, uh, that drains through this area. So yeah, we'd have to go back a little bit, Jessica, but if we were stopping here, you know, that would be it. Although I think it's larger than this, but that's a huge space. So if we do the math uh, and we can get the area, rough area from Google Earth. So we would know how many acres that is. You know, your, you are, um, your micro watershed looks like it's pretty large, but again, it could very well be off off the map here. Let's just back up a little more. <laughs> well, yeah, you're going to have fun with that. <laughs> it, uh, it certainly is rolling back here and let's go back to 40. So at some point you, you would definitely want it to be legible like you've done with your base plan. Um, Cause you can imagine your base plan with uh, say with, five foot contours and how hard it would be to differentiate. So this is a nice interval, but when you get um, further back, it's going to be a little more work. So yeah, it'll be very interesting to see where yours ends up. I'm not sure we're going to find it today. So at some point we're going to go between you know, you're going to have um, these high points are going to go in the other direction. Interesting. Yeah, so you'll you'll have to play with that a little bit, Jessica, just to find. Um, well, a <laughs> got to go back and find your location and see how much of this is actually affecting your uh, site because it's obviously not all going to do that. But the nice thing is with this, you can zoom in and pick up. Uh, it's just when you start drawing on it, it's not going to move as well, at least not, not with my drawing tools. Yeah, I don't know if that helps at all, Jessica. Sorry about that. But <laughs> do, you, do you get the idea of what process you might have to go through here? Yes, I do. It's just on such a larger scale than I imagined. So it'll be more work than I thought. But yeah, and you just have to keep see. in mind, keep in mind that uh, right angle to contour, because there'll be a lot of the space that does not influence your project site. But it certainly looks like it does in here. Right with that creek. But yeah. Yeah, it's all the scale of what you're working at here. So, okay. Well, I hope that helps you out a little bit. Uh, Amber has a question. How large is too large for micro watershed? Well, what it is, Amber, it's, it's all of the lands uphill from your project site that can directly influence it. So in this case, so our, if we look at our practice sheet uh, as an example, 
we have our project boundary uh, down below. And we just start, uh, we start there. So we can put our boundary along the bottom here. And then we can see there's contours uh, heading uphill. And this is not the exact line. Uh, it's quick and dirty, but we're, we're going to end up at this top ridge. Uh, and then we're going to go over here. And this ends up heading up to this ridge. And then it's going to go... Again, this is uh, very fast, not with any accuracy. So in, in essence, that is you know, plus or minus a few percent are micro watershed for that specific property boundary. And you can see how vulnerable <laughs> that might be. Uh, this is definitely a drainage channel here. So water falling within this basin uh, could definitely affect your project site. So now if water falls here, uh, it's heading in this direction, we're all good. So that's not, that's not anything we need to concern ourselves about. It's just what's within this space here. Now we're looking at Jessica's site. That's quite a large, it looks like a large micro watershed boundary. Um, for most of you, it'll probably be much smaller. And again, it really depends on the topographic info. That's going to dictate as long as you're looking at lands that are above, then we're all good. Now, as soon as we go off onto the other side here, we know that this water is heading in that direction and it's not going to impact your, your project site. Uh, so Amber, the nearest hilltops are a few miles. Yeah, and they, that may or may not be draining onto your site. You'd have to take a look, which would make one micro watershed, but the site is in the Piedmont region. Yeah. So again, it's, it's directly, it's lands that are directly influencing. And Dirk has a mountain draining onto there. <laughs> well, that's fortunate for you, Derek. Uh, maybe not in the winter, <laughs> but it, it's that's a huge resource. Um, where I live, we have about about two acres that are draining onto our site. We're near the top of a slope, uh, but our, our, we have two neighbors above us, and they influence ours. But you know, and you can visually see it. It's just confirmed with. Um, with the contour information. So that is, as you can see, very, very important um, to get. So once you have the boundary, don't forget to put the basin in because we are asking for that. So the basin, it's just indicating on which side of the line the basin is. So everything touching uh, within it is, is going to have potentially influence the site and everything outside of it is not so rainfall here we're not concerned about but with this information you can then calculate uh, potentially how much runoff is going to enter your project site and that again is very very helpful when we're looking at um, trying to manage stormwater and hydrate the landscape so yeah well we are basically at the end of our meeting today is there anything that uh, anybody would like to to talk about chat about any questions unanswered and again you have uh, my calendar link there if you need assistance
uh, I, I'm happy to help you. And when we get into the, this is where I really like the video feedback portion of what I do. Um, I'll be looking at your micro watershed uh, work. And if there, and if I see anything different, uh, I will certainly just uh, augment it on screen. I won't be changing your work, of course, but it makes it really easy to, to provide feedback. Um, yeah, and thank you very much everybody for attending today. And uh, yeah, have yourself a great week at the end. So next Monday, we are, um, we're expecting your assignment. And then on the 24th, so I believe it'd be the end of that week, we are into a short break. Um, and then we'll pick up the second half of the course uh, where we will start with our uh, lesson six Q&A and go through that. And that is going to seem very, very easy compared to this one. So this is a bit of a, a full, you know, there's a lot to, to, to deal with, with this lesson and the next one is much easier. So uh, in my experience, most people that get through lesson five, you'll get to the end of the course, right? Because there are, there are people, you know, things happen, um, family issues, whatever, and they don't have time uh, to put into the course. So it's one one thing to consider if if you feel you're being kind of um, pushed in terms of of your workflow and your timing, if if you get through number five, you're you're good to go. So can't promise you that, but <laughs> that's generally what I see. So anyhow, um, I will not uh, do a typical 10 minute uh, Canadian goodbye here, but um, uh, thank you very much everybody for joining me and uh, we look forward to seeing your assignment.